This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osserman, and anything that goes with hydrogen punk that, uh, oh, excuse me, hydrogen, I'm the hydrogen punk that thinks he knows everything about hydrogen and never stops talking about it, except when I can't read the teleprompter. <laughs> so, but today we have a hydrogen exception because we're going to be showing you the biggest, baddest electrical vehicle you probably will ever see, at least on this show. And as usual, the West End gets bragging rights to this badass machine. Hey, don't beat me out there. I said S is in Stan. Your filthy mind, you get raised by mongooses or what? So today, my guest is a man with literally the dirt on this equipment, Mr. Steve Joseph from PVT Land. So welcome, Steve. How you Good doing, to have Stan? you on the show. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that you hold the honor of being my very first guest on Stan Energy Man. <laughs> over two years ago. So thanks for coming out and being back to catch us up on what's going on. So how's things out in Waianae? Still c cranking along? Oh yeah, we're doing well out there. Okay. Very what, I, what I'd like to do is get started by showing a quick video to get people caught up on exactly what PVT Land does out on the west side. So we can roll that video. The PVT recycling system can handle about 1,775 tons of debris a day. That much debris yields about 900 tons of feedstock, enough to produce electricity for up to 12,000 homes. PVT has made a substantial investment in equipment and added 15 new jobs to bring this new recycling system online. An excavator grabs large pieces of wood and plastic too large to pass through the system. These will be processed separately. Concrete and asphalt are separated and will be crushed and reused as cover on roads. Large pieces of metal, including specialty metals, are pulled for off-site recycling and reuse. What remains, a mixed load of construction debris, is loaded into a vibrating taper screen. Pieces of debris smaller than six inches in size fall through the screen onto an unders conveyor. Debris over six inches, which is about 60% of the total debris, continues to the overs conveyor. A magnetic separator pulls anything magnetic, hinges, nails, bolts, and other metal pieces from the conveyor and drops them into a metals bin. A secondary taper screen separates dirt, rocks, broken glass, and other pieces of debris that are less than one inch in size. What is left is prime feedstock material. This debris continues on to the sorting line. Here workers clean and separate, pulling remaining pieces of rock, metal, and other materials from the feedstock debris stream. Up to 42 tons of metals are pulled for recycling by PVT every day. Meanwhile, on the over sorting line, a team of 10 sorts debris six inches and larger, pulling pieces of metal and other materials from the debris stream. These are dropped into bins below the sorting line for recycling. Debris suitable for feedstock is ground and shredded into pieces of uniform size and piled for pickup. By now, all that remains is wood, plastic, paper, cloth, and other materials suitable for bioconversion. That's some pretty slick uh, equipment you got out there and, uh, and pretty yeah. nice looking. It's a pretty nice looking operation. If I was an industrial manager, I'd, I'd be proud of that area. It looks really good. Yeah, it's uh, constant cleanup on it, maintenance, but it does. We can keep it really looking nice all the time. It's a clean operation. So for those of you that might have missed it, this is basically set up so that anybody that has construction debris, whether it's concrete, rebar, or combustibles, takes it out to PVT land, 
and PVT land takes it, sorts it, recycles it if possible, and the combustibles? Yeah, the combustibles will, are going out and have gone out in the past for fuel for different energy sources uh, at Hickam, at AES, uh, a couple of others, and then uh, we already have contracts, agreements in place to continue to produce wood that will allow them to do uh, anaerobic digestion and produce methane for Hawaii gas, can actually produce power out of it mm -hmm. for HECO or private. Yeah, methane has a chemical composition of CH4. Mm -hmm. That means one carbon atom and four of four my favorite hydrogen 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 are all our favorites. You probably were wondering how I'd sneak hydrogen into this <laughs> yeah. discussion, didn't you? But um, let's throw up some of the pictures of some of the other equipment that you have out there, and uh, you can we just kind of talk through them. Those are, you know, the people see these in several different landfill operations. You know, big heavy equipment to move things around. So, what do we got here? Uh, yeah, this is part of our excavation. We're in the process of recycling four million cubic yards of material that was placed in the 80s. So we're digging it all back up and recycling the metal out, recycling the concrete out, recycling the wood and combustibles out. And so we're left with about 10% to go back in. Mm -hmm. And we've in by doing this, we've increased the compaction by about four times greater than it was the first time through. And we recover all this dirt that got lost in the mix, which then gets recycled as our cover. Mm. We just have to get cover. Mm -hmm. Now we have excess cover. Just for comparison, because later on the show we have uh, another another uh, bulldozer. What size bulldozer is this? That's a D8 bulldozer. That's the typical landfill package bulldozer. You notice it's got a real high blade in the front and the grates up. Okay. And that's what's called the landfill package. Yeah, because I'm holding the teaser for the end of the show where we get to talk about the good stuff. But everybody watching, just remember that. That's a D8 bulldozer. What's the next photo we got coming up here? Uh, that's part of our screening operation. We have three screens on site. We pull the material out of the old landfill. We run it through the screener, separating the dirt and some of the others. We take most of it, about 60% goes down into that system we saw in the beginning mm -hmm. to go through that for the fine pick mm -hmm. coming out because there's some things that we need to still pick out of that. Okay. And so uh, apparently, you know, I mean, in a, you know, we're, we're faced on the East Coast with a bunch of disasters right now. And, you know, people say, what do you do with all that stuff that's on the side of the street after a big disaster? Does the city or the state talk to you about that when, uh, when it comes to mitigating disasters and how they get rid of all that uh, um, refuse? Yeah, we were on the first uh, disaster plan 14 years ago. And I can tell you it's probably the scariest committee I've ever sat on. Mm. Now we're redoing it again this year. So what we're doing is taking some of the key personnel because most of what you see in Houston sitting on the street would come to us and then what FEMA requires that as much be recycled as can. And that's exactly what we do. We hit close to 80% recycling on material like that okay. right now. So I mean that all becomes uh, either uh, aggregate the metal goes out for recycle or the wood and combustibles go out to produce energy. Great. So what's the next picture we got, Robert? Let's fill that one up and see what we got there. Okay, of course we do have a lot of dust and stuff that gets picked up when you're doing all this earth moving, so that's probably a pretty important aspect of what you do. Yes, we even have a couple of pieces out there now called the dust destroyer. It throws 10 to 25 micron water about 300 yards. Wow. So it really knocks down everything. Keep the neighbors happy, doesn't keep them any but dust blow in their house. And yeah, stuff. yep, okay. keeps, yeah. keeps all the dust down. What's the next photo we got up? Okay, this is, this is actually one of the more, it looks not like a real interesting picture, but this is one of the sus subjects that really, when people do recycling, they go, how do you make it all work? And uh, isn't it labor intensive? So. This is your, your labor piece. This is where probably a big chunk of your labor goes. Yeah, right here, because you've got to pick through. Um, there are some systems now that are coming into play. We've uh, seen them on the mainland where they actually have automated pickers. Automation is where a lot of this stuff is going. 
and the automated pickers can go through and make 8,000 picks an hour. Wow. But these folks are like on that oversize um, uh, parcels or particles, that, and they're separating out the metal, uh, concrete, glass. Uh, do they actually sort the metal, like by copper, aluminum, Yes, steel? we do. Okay. And including, we <coughs> recycle one thing that nobody else recycles on the island, and that's all the interior wiring. Nobody will ever go into a building and pull the interior wiring out, but when it comes down our pick line there, we pull all the interior wiring out, and it looks a little like a Tony Roma's onion loaf, mm -hmm. and it goes to Oregon for recycle. And that's because it's probably too labor intensive to pull all the insulation off the skinny little wires to make it worth the while. Exactly right. Mm, okay. They do it over there, and okay. So, but. You know, that is something that nobody else is recycling but us. Okay. So, you know, you've been doing this for how many years now? About 13, 14 years now. And your vision at the start was was to be self-sufficient energy-wise and, and maybe just run yourself. But what's your vision now as you look forward in the future to Hawaii's energy, especially now that we're supposed to be all renewable by 2045? Yeah, no, I think it, the future really looks bright on the energy side because there is a number of different things that are coming on from the energy side. We can take a lot of this stuff that used to go into the ground, and now that we're digging up the old landfill and recovering a lot of that stuff, it frees up landfill space, but it also gives us all this material that can go out to produce energy instead of just being tossed in a landfill. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the rest of the recycling, the metal, the concrete, the rest of it. So I think it helps us to be far more efficient and we can produce a lot of energy out, out of what would be otherwise waste. Mm -hmm. And it also sets us up if there is a disaster that hits us, we can also use a lot of that material then becomes energy for us yeah. as well. Well, I'm, I'm glad we're not letting the methane go out in the air because as a carbon, a greenhouse gas, it's probably 14 times or so worse than putting CO2 in the air and other greenhouse gases. So the methane is a really nasty thing to let go. Um, but what's kind of a struggle for me is I go to Kailua landfill and or the waste, waste treat transfer station and drop off my green waste. And right behind me are a couple big uh, flaring towers burning off all the methane from the old Kailua dump. And I just go, wow, that all could be energy and we could be making electricity off of that. But you know, it just, it's not working. What, what, on the industry scale, why is it we're not doing more with the methane that we have right now? The, the problem with it, well, I mean, the, ideally if we captured and used the methane in there, um, the way it's always been done in the past, it comes out into a generator. Um, the problem always is that you have a tail on the front and a tail on the back end of it. So it, you scale your unit to match your peak okay. energy out. So you have to flare the front end because you just don't have enough to run your generator. When it peaks to the top, you've got a top that you can't burn, you can't run through the generator and you gotta burn, it's too yeah. much. And on the back end, you got this long tail where it isn't enough to, to run, run the generator. generator. I mean, mm -hmm. ideally you'd need three separate generators to max out that kind of deal. And you know what happens to the capital cost yeah, when yeah. you do that. You have to have a baby generator and a mama <laughs> generator and a papa generator. Yeah, okay, exactly. I got it. Exactly. It's a three bears so, scenario. I, I have I looked see. at this and landfill gas issues a lot, trying to figure yeah. out ways to solve. Well, how about it? I mean, using the same analogy that we do with my favorite thing, hydrogen, why don't we store some of that methane so that we can push it all through the right size generator and just use all of it instead of flaring any of it. Is that a possibility? Yeah, no, that is that is a real possibility. Mm -hmm. and that. But the problem always has been it's more, all of this goes in mainly to get rid of the gas, mm -hmm. not with the idea of actually producing power more than what you've designed into that part of the system. What kind of pressure does the landfill actually off gas out. I mean, if you if you didn't if you didn't have to compress the gas, if you just like vented it and, and put it right into a tank, at what point would the tank kind of be pushing against the landfill on the pressure? It only comes out at about five pounds. Five PSI? Yeah. So I mean yeah. the problem is the pressure's so low on it. And you you kinda have to pull it. Uh -huh. With those systems you have to put a slight negative pressure on it. What you're trying to do is capture it all. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't go out in the neighborhood. Right. 
So you have a little negative pressure on it to pull like in. Like vacuum it in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it just, at that point, you could compress it. Okay. For, for us, because we don't have any methane, because our stuff doesn't break down, mm -hmm. we actually sequester CO2. We yeah, pump CO2 into the mm -hmm. landfill to get rid of the oxygen out of it so that we don't have a fire or something else. Ah, okay. So I have, somebody was telling me the other day, well, you've got to check into the credits for sequestering carbon. <laughs> I hadn't even looked at it. Yeah, you might have tax credits you're missing already. Yeah, hadn't even thought about that <coughs> part of it. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in 60 seconds with uh, Steve Joseph from PVT Lab. Dad Rawlson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech, where we talk about drones, anything you, to do about drones, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned air crystals, whatever you want to call them, emerging into Hawaii's economy, educational framework, and our public life. We talk about things associated with the use, the misuse, uh, technology, engineering, legislation, with the local experts as well as people from across the country. Please join us noon on Thursdays and catch the latest on what's taking place in the world of drones that might affect you. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, Energy Man here with Steve Joseph from PVT Land. And we're talking dirt, Hawaiian dirt to be specific, and construction debris and all good things that happen out on the west side, making energy out of nothing at all. In fact, uh, and that should be a song. We should write a song. <laughs> yeah. Talk to Gabby or somebody and we'll make a song on this thing. Anyway, um, let's, let's look at some more of the photos that we have uh, of your operation out there, and you can tell us about them. Yeah, we're crush a, we crush a lot of concrete out there, mm -hmm. and uh, that gets recycled for our roads. Or the other thing we're doing is uh, crushing concrete and using it for ballast on uh, photovoltaic right. panels. Right, so you don't have to drop by piles and, yeah. and put foundations down. Yep. So it's important for the viewers to look at the, and I'm, I'm showing these pictures for a reason. I want you to see all the different kind of equipment that he has out there because we're going somewhere with this. So throw another photo up there, Robert. This is actually some of the feedstock, and I'll let Steve talk about where it went. Yeah, this feedstock went actually out to Hickam for, to power the unit that's out at uh, Hawaii Air National Guard. This also, some of this went out for uh, a couple of other test burns mm -hmm. with people for use, uh, AES, a uh, couple of other ones. Yeah, so the reason that uh, we actually looked, uh, this is a project that HCAT does out at Hickam, we needed specific f um, recipes of landfill material to run in our gasifier, okay. and um, it was way more cost effective for you to do the sorting and get us the right recipes than for us to do it on site. And so, uh, so this was destined to go into our gasifier at 10 ton a day, and uh, I saw a lot of this material being processed while they did their last 30 days of uh, testing. So, next, next picture. This gets into the good stuff that we wanted to talk about for the community, but. Yeah, this is uh, part of the uh, picture. We're in the process right now of closing out a portion of the landfill and re-landscaping uh, it with a lot of native Hawaiian vegetation in there. So that um, actually, we, when we get it all done, it, won't even look yeah. like a landfill. Let's look at the next picture. I think that yeah. shows us like a current or a before picture, correct? That's a before. And then the yeah. next photo is the after picture. And that's the after picture. So you see all the landscaping that was in between the, um, the lower portion mm -hmm. and the upper portion is yeah. what they're going to put in there. So from the roadways and the community, not only do you not have any dust now, you, you have nice landscape to look at. Have a nice landscape. Yeah. What are some of the other plans as you expand? Because you, you've actually got more land out there and probably expect more volume. What are some of the other things you're doing with the community out there? Yeah, we're working with the community on a lot of different things in there. We're 
actually looking at the possibility of uh, doing some things with the schools, maybe in uh, either hydroponics or in aqua culture out there. And then uh, we're planning, we're looking at putting about uh, 1,400 uh, photovoltaic panels on the landfill to power everything you saw in the first video mm -hmm. without going to HECO at all for it. So you're going to be an off-the-grid operation? Off-the-grid operation. Okay. So that means in a disaster, when heat goes down, we will still be working. Great. You can still absorb all that, um, all the stuff that needs to be sorted and, and, and saved up, recycled, and made into energy. Made into energy. Great. Okay. Let's throw the next photo up. This actually gets us into a good part of our discussion. This is, uh, we showed you the picture earlier of a D8 which is kind of like the standard uh, land moving equipment um, for a landfill operation. And so tell us about why this is so different. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things. This is a D7 electric. <laughs> this will come in, uh, I think the third week of this month, it'll be delivered to us. It is an electric bulldozer. And it is one of the smartest things I think we've done. This thing, um, it runs, it runs like my, I own a Chevy Bolt, runs like the same as a Chevy Bolt. It's got a small diesel engine in there running a generator, supplying electrical power. So it has no torque converter, no transmission, no drive line. It's all electric. So it's less to maintain. That bulldozer will push as much as the bulldozer you first saw. So a D7 electric will push as much as a D8 diesel and it operates at 50% less fuel usage. So yeah, it's easier to batteries operate. Batteries are energy, uh, electric energy is much cheaper than burning diesel. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, the torque on it allows you to take a smaller piece of equipment and just get much more uh, mm -hmm. torque out of it and push. And it's easier to operate. Yeah, I can you... teach my secretary to operate that. <laughs> don't, don't say that. <laughs> My secretary will be at that looking for a job. Okay, so, I mean, this really demonstrates in a real way the advantage to electric um, drivetrains on almost everything, cars, heavy equipment, um, and you have a diesel-electric hybrid, essentially. Yeah. Um, but what's the future hold for this piece of equipment when the warranty's out? Because we've talked about that one. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's what's... why you're on my show. <laughs> yeah, Stan and I both love this one. Once the warranty's out, then we can yank the engine out, yank the generator out, drop fuel cells into it, power it with fuel cells, and make the hydrogen on site using photovoltaic panels and water. Yeah, or anaerobic digestion even. You yeah. might steam or form your own hydrogen out of your own landfill. Yeah. That'd be awesome. So, but every, you know, what's really important is when you take a look at the future, this is where the future is going. When you look at uh, John Deere equipment, they're going to hydrogen. The, a lot cat and a lot of the others are going electric, and Hitachi, who makes the large excavators we use, are going to hybrid excavators. They've been working on perfecting that for the last seven years. So this is where the direction that heavy equipment is going because it's more efficient. Yeah, and in fact, the model that you just described with your D7 is exactly what I'm trying to show the Air Force that if you want to start off by saving fuel, you start off by going hybrid. Mm -hmm. Go with a smaller engine that runs a generator at its peak performance, best energy efficiency on that carbon fuel, and gives you electricity, it gives you a superior drivetrain. And then the next step is just wean yourself off the hydrogen or the, the fossil fuel base and put in the fuel cell and go with renewables, solar, wind, uh, steam reform mm -hmm. off of methane, to get your hydrogen, and now you don't need to bring in fuel from anywhere. You don't have to buy it from Saudi Arabia or Indonesia or anyone else. You, you just make it on site, and you, you make it from what you've got on base. And that saves the Air Force logistics costs. It means you don't risk, pe risk, um, risk people in convoys driving fuels to bases overseas when you're deployed in a combat zone or fly airplanes into a combat zone to deliver 55 gallon drums of fuel. You make it where you're at because all you need is sunlight, wind, waste, yeah. wastewater, waste, and uh, you're yeah. off and running. And for us on the island, it's so important because 
every drop of oil that we import, that dollar we pay for it, leaves the island. Mm -hmm. If we're using the material that we have that goes out for generation, we're using photovoltaic and water to generate power, all of those, all that does is create jobs on the island and keeps the money in our economy instead of those dollars leaving. Well, as a businessman, you probably can appreciate that better than I'd say a bunch of the legislators we have in our in our government and a lot of people yeah. that work in government, they, they don't make that connection. But the economic piece and losing that, I mean, if you look at, you hear people talk about gross domestic product and, and you know, trade deficits and things. This is our big trade deficit. We're, lo we're, we're at a loss because we're sending money out of the state to bring in something to burn, yep. you know, and that just doesn't make sense to any of us. So yeah. that's, a, that's a huge, huge piece. Yeah. To kind of give you an idea on the bulldozer, that electric bulldozer, which will push as much as a bigger one, is $180,000 less cost and 50% fuel savings on it, easier to operate, less costly to maintain. Mm -hmm. It is a smart business decision all the way down the yeah. line with that piece of equipment. And just for a second, because we're getting close to the end of the show, let's talk about tier four diesel engines and that may be a big reason why you're saving money on an electric bulldozer today and into the future. Yeah, the tier four engines are for us and our heavy equipment, you know, a regular truck driving, if it goes 45 miles an hour for 20 minutes, burns off all the carbon. The tier four engines hold that carbon until you can do that. Well, none of that equipment you've seen in the pictures is ever going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So we have to pull out that converter, but for lack of a better term, a carbon getter, and send it out for bake out for a lot of money. If the stuff the Blue Planet's been working on, where you can inject in uh, hydrogen into it, so in other words, if you change your timing to top dead center, pull in less diesel fuel, inject the hydrogen in at the end and fire it, you get maximum compression and total burn and, yeah, clean, of the clean, diesel, clean, clean. Yeah. and yeah. more power out of it. And I've kind of played with the numbers on hydrogen production. Mm -hmm. I think we're down around less than $2 or close to $2 per gallon equivalent on diesel. I like to hear those numbers. Oh, I love those numbers too. <laughs> I'm looking at this, I'm going, uh, you know, I'm hoping Blue Plan is successful with the engineering they're doing. Right. I'd convert every piece of equipment over. Well, we're coming up on the end of the show here and we're glad that you can come and share all this. And I feel like I'm right at home talking to you because yeah. you were, we've had the mind meld for quite a few years now. But um, all of those other vehicles we showed, the potential is there for those to go to electric and eventually hydrogen fuel cell as well, right? Yep. Every one of them. Well, and I think, uh, you know, I think really that's the way it's going to go, just from cost and efficiency, ease of maintenance on it. Because yeah. all that heavy equipment is very costly to maintain. All right, Steve. Well, thanks for being on the show today. And uh, I'll have to have you yeah. back sooner than two years from now on, <laughs> on my next show. But thanks yeah. for being with us on Stan Energy Man. I hope you like visiting the West, west Side and seeing what uh, we do when we take uh, our leftover stuff and recycle it and turn it into energy. So be with us next week with Stan Energy Man where Rachel James will teach you all kinds of things about energy because I'm gonna be in DC. Aloha. <laughs>